Right, welcome to the keynote address of the 2023 uh, Student Affairs Research Colloquium. This is indeed a proud moment for us. Uh, the keynote address will be delivered by Professor John Shu, and the title of the keynote address is Assessment and Evaluation, Some Thoughts, Ideas and Musings. And uh, welcome to each of you who joined us in the auditorium, but also welcome to each and every person that joined us with the live stream. So uh, I'm going to introduce the keynote speaker, and then uh, we've got three respondents that are also going to respond to the keynote address, and I'm quickly going to introduce all four of them. So Professor John Shu, over 47 years career, uh, John Shu held administrative and faculty assignments at Iowa State University um, in Indiana, Indiana University, Wichita State University, and Arizona State University. Um, at ISU, he is a distinguished professor emeritus and served as a departmental chair for six and a half years, director of the School of Education for 18 months, and is an honorary alumnus. He was director of the Emerging Leaders Academy at ISU from July 2013 until retiring in May 2017. Uh, Shu received his Master's of Counseling and PhD degrees from ASU, that's Arizona State University. So Professor Shu is the author, co-author, and editor of over 275 publications, including 33 books and monographs, more than 80 book chapters, and over 110 articles. Among his books and monographs are Student Services, a Handbook for the Profession, the sixth ed edition, with Susan Jones and Vasti Torres, who also visited the University of the Free State some years ago, Assessment in Student Affairs, the second edition, with Patrick Biddix, Laura Dean, and Gillian Kinsey in 2016, and one size does not fit all traditional and innovative models of student affairs practice, second edition in 2013 with Kathy Manning and Gillian McKenzie. And these are uh, big names for those of you who are familiar with uh, student affairs literature. He served uh, on the senior editorial team of the New Directions for Student Services uh, source book series from 1997 to 2016 and was associated editor of the Journal of College Student Development for 14 years, a very prestigious uh, international journal. He has made over 300 presentations and speeches to campus-based regional, national, and international meetings and served as a cons consultant to more than 90 90 organizations. Professor John Shu has received numerous awards, including the Research Achievement Award from the Association for the Study on Higher Education, the Lifetime Achievement Award, uh, the Contribution to Knowledge Award from the American College Personnel Association, the Contribution to Research or Literature Award, and the Robert H. Schaeffer Award for Academic Excellence as a graduate faculty member from the National Association of Student Personnel Administrators. The Association of College and Housing um, and University Housing Offices International, also known as ACUI, presented Professor Shu with the S. Earl Thompson Award in 1999 for his contributions to the campus housing field and the Research and Publications Award in 2019. Professor Shu received the Fulbright Award to study higher education in Germany in 1994, was named to the Fulbright Specialist Program in 2008 and had a Fulbright Specialist's assignment in South Africa in 2012. He has been engaged with institutions of higher education in Scotland, England, Germany, Syria, Ukraine, Bulgaria, Hong Kong, Ireland, Macau, Malaysia, South Africa, Saudi Arabia, and Turkey. Professor Shu, it is an absolute honor and a privilege to have you on the platform. I'm going to give you an opportunity to quickly greet the audience. Thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. Right. Um, then, as I indicated, we've got three respondents that's also, um, who are also going to respond uh, give uh, responses to the keynote address, and uh, we are very honored to have our own 
uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research uh, on the platform, recently joined the University of the Free State, uh, Professor Vasu Reddy. Uh, Professor Vasu Reddy is the Deputy Vice Chancellor Research and Internationalization uh, at the University of the Free State, a professor of sociology. He was also former dean of the Faculty of Humanities at the University of Pretoria in South Africa. He is a NRFB1 rated researcher with primary research interests in genders, sexualities, poverty, inequalities, and more specifically, the history of ideas. He is a member of the Academy of Sciences of South Africa. Um, beyond articles in these areas, more recent publications are Queer in Africa, LGBTQI Identities, Citizenship and Activism, um, Queer Kingship, South African Perspectives on the Sexual Politics of Family Making and Belonging, um, State of the Nation, Poverty um, and Inequalities, Diagnosis, Prognosis, Responses, um, and uh, of course these publications were written with, with uh, well-known scholars like uh, Professor Crane Sudin, uh, Ingrid Wulland, and so on. The Fabric uh, of Descent Public Intellectuals in South Africa, the lead editor with Narnia Bowler Muller, Craig Houston, Maxi Schumann, and Heather Theisman, Theisma, State of the Nation, Ethics, Politics, Inequalities, New Directions, uh, another publication, University on the Border Crisis of Authority and um, Precarity, and Texture of Descent, Defiant Public Intellectuals in South Africa. Uh, forthcoming in 2023, this year, is an edited volume titled Teta Sizwe, Contemporary South African Debates on African Languages and the Politics of Gender and Sexualities. Um, and in 2024, an edited volume titled State of the Nation, Quality of Life and Well-Being. Uh, and in that regard, he's the lead editor with the HSRC Press. It is an absolute uh, honor and a privilege to welcome Professor Vasu Reddy, our own uh, Deputy Vice-Chancellor for Research and Internalization. I'm going to hand it over to you, Professor Reddy, to uh, quickly greet the audience as well. Thank you. Thank you, a colleague, and uh, welcome and good afternoon to everybody. And looking forward to, to listening to our keynote. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our uh, next respondent is Dr. Munita dan uh, a very um, honored and treasured colleague of mine um, in the Division of Student Affairs. Um, Dr. Munita dan started on 1 December 2021 as the Director of Student Counseling and Development at the University of the Free State. She worked in student communities as well as student counseling at Stellenbosch University for 11 years prior to moving to uh, the UFS, and that's where I got to know her um, when she was still working at Stellenbosch University. She's a registered counseling psychologist and obtained her master's degree in counseling psychology cum laude um, at Stellenbosch University in 2001. She has completed a doctorate degree, um, D. Dyack in play therapy in 2004 at the University of South Africa. Dr. Dan Kutsia has proven managerial experience in a higher education context for the past 16 years within the Division of Student Affairs, providing her with extensive knowledge of student affairs matters. As she is fond of research and studying, she obtained an MPhil in higher education, also cum laude, during 2013, and the focus being social change within higher education. She has published nationally and internationally and has presented at several national and international conferences. Uh, Dr. Dan Kutsi, it's an absolute privilege also to welcome you on the platform, joining me here in the venue, and um, I'm gonna give you an opportunity just to welcome uh, the audience as well. Good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful to be here, and to our keynote address, we're waiting in anticipation. 
Right, and then the third respondent um, is uh, Dr. Birgit Schreiber, joining us all the way uh, from Germany. She's a well-known name in higher education in South Africa. Unfortunately, Dr. Sibusisu Chalufu could not have joined us, but uh, we are very grateful um, for Be uh, Dr. Schreiber to join us um, as the third respondent uh, to the keynote address. So Dr. Birgit Schreiber, um, is a consulting expert for the international higher education sector, has served as senior leadership positions with expertise uh, in sub-Saharan Africa and the European higher education sector. Birgit has worked with a range of national and transnational bodies, notably uh, universities of, um, University of South Africa, or USAF as we know it, uh, DART, uh, which is in Germany, and Erasmus, uh, teaches and does research and supervision, program design and policy evaluation. Um, Birgit has recently completed a book on global student affairs with colleagues from Boston Center on International Higher Education and has over 90 publications on various themes around social justice, student affairs, student engagement and higher education. She was the founding editor and is the editor Executive of the Journal of Student Affairs in Africa. She's on the board of the Journal of College Student Development and a column editor for the Journal of College and Character. Um, after being the Africa Chair, she is the Vice President for the International Association of Student Affairs and Services. I think uh, an international association that's really making a significant uh, impact in the field of student affairs internationally. She has received numerous awards, most recently the Noam Chomsky Award for International Research and the NASPA Award for International Practice. She's a member of the Africa Center for um, Trans-Regional Research at the Albert Ludwig University Freiburg in Germany, research associate at Pretoria University, Germany director for the Star Scholars Network and sits on the board of the South African National Research Center at the University of Johannesburg. Uh, Dr. Schreiber, it's an absolute honor and a privilege also to welcome you on the platform. I'm going to give you an opportunity to greet our audience as well. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Val, for having me on and inviting me on and greetings to colleagues and dear friends in the room. Thank you so much. So, um, colleagues, you can sit back, relax. We're looking forward to a wonderful and insight keynote address by Professor John Shu. Professor Shu, I'm handing over to you. Thank you very much. Um, the screen is, is up, so you'll be able to see my PowerPoints, and uh, I'll try to follow them. We don't have a huge amount of time this morning, so this will appear to be superficial. And if that's your impression, the answer is yes, that's exactly what it is. It's just a few thoughts, a few ideas, and maybe some musings about what does it mean for an institution to shift its focus uh, to research from uh, the other two uh, aspects that are typically associated with higher education, uh, teaching and service. Uh, next slide, please. The, I've, I've got several uh, purposes of this presentation I identified. One is to talk a little bit about developing an evidence-based uh, approach to measuring the effectiveness of student affairs-based programs, experiences, and services. We'll also take a look at some of the high impact practices that are related to uh, enhancing the student experience. We'll talk a little bit about learning outcomes and then talk about a few of the central elements related to assessing uh, and evaluating the effectiveness of student affairs uh, based programs. Next slide, please. I'm using as a sample um, strategic vision, that of, of uh, UFS. UFS. Uh, so this says, in effect, you want to be a research-led, student-centered, regionally engaged university that contributes uh, to development uh, in social justice through the production of globally competitive graduates and knowledge. So that's a, that's a lofty strategic vision. 
uh, particularly when you think about globally competitive graduates and knowledge. The stage essentially becomes one of Asia, Europe, uh, certainly uh, Africa, but also North America. Next slide, please. There are some strategic goals that have been established for uh, student affairs uh, at the University of the Free State. And this again is an example uh, of what strategic goals might look like. Uh, they include uh, a goal related to student success, a goal related to student well-being, a student, uh, a, a, a goal related to student development, and a goal related to the student experience. Uh, I want to focus just a little bit on the culture of care and sense of belonging for all students uh, on all three of, of the UFS campuses. My back of the envelope kind of uh, uh, self-developed uh, definition of culture is simply this. Culture is what we do or how we do things here, wherever here might be, your institution, uh, my institution, my most recent institution, Iowa State University, how do we do things here? Cultures are different uh, from one institution to the next and even within uh, institutions of, of higher education. Uh, what contributes a great deal to an institution's culture um, is its, its mission. And we've talked about that a little bit and the, how the mission of UFS is changing um, and focusing more on research. That's gonna affect student affairs in a number of ways. Uh, I wanted to talk just a little bit about working with faculty and what faculty will do. During my career, I had the pleasure of being a student affairs administrator primarily for 27 years, and then a faculty member and academic administrator for 20 years. So I've had a chance to look at institutional cultures from the student affairs perspective, as well as the faculty and academic administrative perspective. And the faculty perspective will influence to a certain extent what we do in student affairs and ultimately how we go about our business and, and beyond that, being able to pro provide evidence that what we do in student affairs contributes to the overall mission of the institution. And in this case, it's shifting uh, over to the, the research emphasis that uh, talked about previously. There are some very specific things that are likely to happen as a consequence of the shift of the research focus. One is that uh, what faculty members are asked to do is going to shift from a huge emphasis on teaching and service to much more of an emphasis on research, which would be defined as the uh, development uh, and production of scholarly activities such as articles, books, uh, research projects, uh, the acquisition of external funding for research uh, programs that faculty members will be asked to enhance. Some won't be able to do it, and that will cause some institutional tensions uh, over time. They will say, I was hired here to teach, and now you're asking me to do research, um, and uh, they probably won't admit to not having uh, developed skills strongly enough uh, to have a uh, big time research program, but the fact of the matter is it's going to be a challenge for them. Uh, as new faculty members are hired, uh, they will be people who have a research focus and have been uh, academically prepared to go about research projects. The spending patterns of the institution may change. Uh, from money being spent on undergraduate education and faculty teaching to graduate education and research. Faculty interaction with students is likely to shift and move into the direction of research projects, even with undergraduates. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. Uh, faculty members may have less interest in uh, student activities uh, but they, they may become more interested in partnering with 
uh, graduate and even undergraduate students in research projects. All of this will result in a change in the culture of, of your institution. At least that's been my experience as I've worked at institutions and consulted with them uh, throughout the US. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? So let's bring us back to assessment, evaluation, and research, which is really the purpose of why we're, we're here today, but within an environment that is, that is changing. And I've drawn my uh, definition from uh, a book that will appear on the reference list, uh, one that I wrote with uh, Patrick Biddix, Laura Dean, and Jillian, uh, Jillian Kinsey. There are three elements that I think are important for the purpose of um, today's discussion. The first being assessment. And essentially what this is, is uh, gathering, analyzing, and interpreting evidence which describes effectiveness. The simple question is, were the goals of the project achieved? Uh, and assessment is usually uh, framed by a theory. Uh, one of my favorites always has been Alexander Astin's theory of student engagement, and there's a reference to his original article uh, on this. Uh, Alexander Astin passed away uh, within the last uh, year or so. Uh, he was an absolute giant in terms of developing um, the theoretical base for why we're engaged in uh, uh, developing programs, experiences, and so on for students. So the question then becomes, okay, were the goals achieved? Uh, were those goals consistent with what we're trying to do? Uh, and that brings us then to evaluation. Uh, if the assessment data indicate that yes, what we set out to achieve has been achieved, well then the question is, uh, are these results consistent uh, with the larger purposes of, um, uh, of our units and of the, of the uh, institution? Uh, one of the uh, aspects of all this that I think is important to consider is the extent to which um, the program being effective related to the use of the time of personnel, uh, the, the uh, use of facilities for the program, and of course, the question we always get back to is, was the budget appropriate? Was the money spent well? Then there's one other aspect of this that probably spends um, less time for student affairs administrators and more for people like Professor Aston and others. And that is um, re research. Uh, this has to do with testing theories such as does Aston's theory of student engagement apply uh, to let's say what's uh, going on in a learning community or what's going on in student work projects and so on. Uh, these often are financed out of grants or contracts. Uh, assessments use research methods, but they're typically not as rigorous as research projects. And uh, I think this is really important to remember because assessment is often time bound, meaning that a program is over and then we assess it and have to have um, a, a report, an analysis of what happens so that the evaluation side of this can, uh, can kick in, which essentially means do we continue the program or not. Uh, research is very different in the, in the sense that it's not time bound. Um, it doesn't have any political dimension to it and the financing might come from, um, from other sources other than a, an organizational budget. May I have the next uh, slide, please? So when we get right down to the purposes of assessment, there are really two questions that we're trying to answer. From an accountability point of view, did the initiative achieve its goals? Just that simple. What did you set out to do and did you get there? Uh, you might uh, consider a, a, a metaphor for this, taking a trip. You start from point A and you want to get to point B and do something and then get back to point A. Well, did you, did you make the trip and get to point B successfully or your experience is what you planned and then did you get back to point A? So did the initiative achieve its goals? It's that simple. And then there's the second component to this, which has to do in with certainly kind of moving into evaluation, which has to do with how do we get better? 
Uh, no, nobody's perfect, no program is per perfect. So the question is, uh, how do we get better? How do we make it more effective? How do we get more students involved uh, if, the, if the program has achieved its goals and so on? How do we become more efficient in terms of using our resources? So we've got an accountability dimension to this and then the improvement uh, dimension as well. Uh, the next slide, please. I think as we move into um, a more research focused institution, I, th I think it will be very valuable to think about the kinds of practices, uh, programs that are uh, part of the portfolio of what's offered in student affairs at your institution. I've provided the entire list here. Um, and this, the time does not allow me to go through all of these, but I want to talk about just a couple of them because I think uh, these are likely to be a, affected by uh, the shift uh, toward more of a research focus. Um, one is the first year seminar project. Um, many, many institutions now have first year seminars. Further research on first year seminars indicates that first year seminars that are, are focused on a topic or a course or focused on a project or research are very effective and probably um, are um, uh, more desirable than simply thinking of a first year seminar as an extended orientation program. Um, Another one of these that, uh, that I think is a, a high impact practice uh, worth, uh, worth looking at is undergraduate research. When I was involved in a project that I may have time to describe a little bit later on in this presentation uh, with George Koo, uh, which led to the book Student Success in College. And again, it's, it's referenced uh, on the, on the uh, reading list at the end. Uh, one of the things we found was that at many of the institutions we studied, undergraduate research was very important. My sense is this will ramp up as your institution uh, more and more focuses on research. And the consequence is that faculty will be interested in doing undergraduate research. An example of this is the Student uh, Research Initiative at the University of Michigan, which in my opinion is one of the great universities, not only in the, in the US, but in the world. And there is an undergraduate research program that gets first year students involved in research projects with faculty. And uh, I, I think that's probably the direction more and more research institutions will go as they get students involved um, in um, uh, research research projects. Um, I want to say just a word or two out of about these high impact uh, practices and what some of the implications might be uh, for the students with whom you work. My sense is as your institution develops more and more uh, of um, reputation related to research, more and more of your students will be interested in pursuing graduate school uh, and research projects uh, and using their undergraduate experience to prepare them for that, uh, as opposed to finishing their degree and then moving immediately into the workforce. Um, I think more students will be interested in undergraduate research uh, projects, as I mentioned before. I also think that internships, which are listed on these practices, will be more related to uh, research projects and collaborative projects, again, listed on this uh, uh, series of high impact practices, uh, very well might involve uh, students collaborating with faculty in other ways. And then finally, capstone courses, which are fairly common uh, in the US, may center more on research projects as opposed to uh, uh, developing kind of a, a massive literature review in a particular content area. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about this as I have um, uh, time at the end, but I, I did want to list these practices because my sense is that more and more of what you do will be 
trending in the direction of these kinds of projects. And of course, um, there'll be a, a, an assessment dimension uh, to them. So let's move ahead to the next slide, please. There are some key elements that I think are important in assessment projects. Uh, and I wanna talk about uh, three of them that um, I think are, are essential. The first is that assessment, assessment projects need to be ongoing, meaning that they, will, they should be conducted year after year after year as uh, programs are developed and refined and so on. When I was at Indiana University, um, when, I, when I started there, it was pretty clear that there had been no assessment projects of the quality of life in the residence halls. And the quality of life in the residence halls was something about which I was responsible. So we began uh, the first year I was there and then continued for nine consecutive years of doing what we called uh, was an environmental assessment of the quality of life in the residence halls at Indiana University. Uh, we would begin collecting our data, usually the first, uh, the first Tuesday in October. Uh, we would try to have uh, the data all collected uh, within a month, analyzed by Thanksgiving and a report on the desk of the chancellor and the vice president for student affairs uh, before the end of the semester. Uh, the value in all of this was not only to get a snapshot of what quality of life was according to our student, uh, our student respondents uh, each year, but also to compare where we were making progress and where we needed to do more uh, in the way of uh, uh, interventions to improve the quality of, of life. Uh, and so we did this for nine years in a row. And uh, in the beginning, there was some question in the minds of those who were long-termers at uh, Indiana University as to whether or not we could actually do this because it uh, was a residential system of 12,500 single students and another almost 1,500 uh, students living in apartment units on the campus. And so it was a fairly massive project, uh, but I had had some experience with this uh, previously in my career and through some great work uh, that I was paying attention to uh, related to the Western Interstate Commission for Higher Education. So we got it done once and then we did it again and again and again and again to the point where if we didn't have a report uh, on the chancellor's desk by, uh, oh, about the 10th to 15th of December, I'd get a little phone call from his assistant, which would kind of say, where's the report? We're looking forward to it. Um, and of course, we managed to get them in on time. But the point of it all was that by making this an ongoing process, people got used to evaluating the quality of life in the residence halls and then using the second semester to make changes to try to improve the quality of life in the residence halls. Uh, second element that I think is worth talking about is assessment across the institution, which means that um, this should not be just episodic in the sense of we do it in one program, but not another and so on and so on and so on. But rather we try to do it across the institution uh, throughout, throughout all of student affairs. It will look differently in one program to another. I've talked about assessing the quality of life um, in the residence halls at Indiana, which was a massive project. But I've worked in other assessment uh, projects where we looked at the quality of services and the quality of experiences in a um, uh, center that was designed to uh, promote access for persons with disabilities. I've looked at one uh, in terms of the experiences of, of students who served as uh, officials in a recreation program, which had never been done before. Uh, and so there are other programs like this that I think need to be done in addition to just kind of the massive um, uh, approach that we took in the residence halls in Indiana. There are lots and lots of places uh, where we can learn more and more about the student experience and how to, uh, how to improve it. And then finally, um, one of the elements that's important is that we try to promote change in the desired direction. That is uh, going back to the original elements that we talked about uh, in uh, I think the second, uh, the second uh, or third slide 
Uh, those are the changes we're trying to work at. For example, uh, uh, enhancing the culture of care and concern uh, for students. Uh, that's a, a direction that is highly laudable and certainly uh, one that uh, makes perfect sense, I think, across student affairs across the world. And so uh, that would be, I think, very consistent with, uh, uh, with the general plan for uh, an institution in, in student affairs and uh, certainly a goal of assessment projects, again, moving into the evaluation dimension of it. Uh, the next slide, please. What we find in student affairs um, is that uh, we have learning outcomes that can be direct and learning outcomes that are indirect, not listed on the references, but a person whose work I want to cite uh, for your information is that of uh, uh, Mary Lou Bresciani, uh, who is at Loyola University in Chicago. Uh, she has done some brilliant work in related, related to learning outcomes. In fact, some years ago, she and I did a program together in Macau, uh, which is a very interesting, very interesting place to go. Uh, and she has great things to share in her writings about learning outcomes. I think one of the best ways to find out what students have uh, learned in terms of a direct outcome is to simply ask them. Can you demonstrate what you say you've learned? And this can be uh, done through individual interviews and through focus groups. Um, just that simple. You say you've improved your leadership skills. Uh, what evidence do you have that your leadership skills have improved? Um, others are, are using rubrics uh, to observe students um, when they're engaged in their activities. I also think it's very useful to review documents, uh, documents such as agendas, uh, minutes from meetings, uh, and so on. And I've got other things listed here that can be used uh, to provide direct learning outcomes. Um, one of the best research projects uh, that I ever had a chance to uh, serve on as a faculty member had to do with the experiences that students had in participating in um, <clears throat> international experiences. These, this was a group of 17 students who spent about a semester uh, abroad as part of their undergraduate experience and they were asked to keep journals. Uh, and so they did. And then at the end of the uh, experience abroad, they uh, um, not only gave us their, their journals, but we had uh, meetings with them. And uh, what we learned, among other things, in terms of uh, study abroad, is uh, the more students do this on their own and the longer they're engaged uh, outside of their home institution, the more potent the uh, uh, learning outcomes uh, are. And so, you know, that was really good to know as we think about crafting uh, international experiences. There are also indirect learning outcomes that occur. Uh, again, reviewing portfolios or journals, uh, looking at persistence and graduation rates uh, of students who participate in certain programs. We know, for example, that students who participate in learning communities, um, at least at Iowa State University, have a higher persistence rate from the first year to the second year uh, than students who don't. And then there are other artifacts that uh, uh, can be used. Can I have the next slide, please? So how do you get started? How do you get started doing uh, assessment and evaluation projects? Uh, my suggestion is start somewhere, do something. It doesn't have to be a massive project like the one I referred to at Indiana University, where we were looking at a, at a sample of uh, 12,500 uh, single students in the residence halls, uh, but rather begin with small projects. There is uh, uh, an organizational uh, 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 psychologist and consultant uh, just retired at the University of Michigan named Carl Weick, W-E-I-C-K. And he wrote an article years ago called Small Wins, 
And essentially the, the point he was making was when you want to think about organizational change, start with something small and manageable that will be successful. And as you move forward in, um, in your projects, as they become more complex and so on, you can take them on uh, with experience of, uh, of uh, success in a small project. So I recommend something small. Uh, maybe not looking at an entire residential set, uh, system, but what's going on in one residence hall or what's going on in one residential floor. Um, as you propose uh, new initiatives, new programs, new experiences, make sure that there's an assessment dimension that's built into the plan uh, so that you can answer the question, how will you know if the initiative worked? Well, the answer is we will have an assessment project uh, as part of the program and uh, we'll be able to tell from the data that are available. When you don't know how to do certain things about the project, get some help. Um, in your institution, typically uh, people in student affairs don't get into the work because they love um, uh, working with research methods quantitative or qualitative, depending on, on the nature of the project. Uh, but if you're not sure about handle of this, handling the statistics related to a project, don't worry about it, but get some help from a statistician. I can tell you as a faculty member uh, who directed uh, a number of dissertations, uh, I always insisted that when our students, uh, our doctoral students were doing a quantitative study that we made sure that there was a statistician on the student's research committee just so we could be sure that the statistical methods were done appropriately. I'd recognize uh, here that uh, you, you should not wait for a crisis before doing an assessment project. It is very difficult to do an assessment project uh, within a highly charged political atmosphere. So as a matter of course, uh, start taking on assessment projects um, and don't wait for a crisis to demand that an assessment project be done. And in your report, recognize that uh, your project will have some shortcomings. You might have to uh, cut corners a little bit on sampling. Uh, maybe you didn't able, you weren't able to ask every question that you wanted. I'd refer you to the work of uh, Pat Terenzini from the Center for the Study of Higher Education at Penn State University, who is retired now, but used to write some about uh, doing assessment and evaluation projects um, in student affairs. And he would indicate that one of the things we need to do is be sure to recognize um, that uh, projects will have shortcomings and don't ap apologize for them, but just recognize that, uh, that they're done. The next slide, please. Now be sure once you've completed your report that you report the results, whether they're good or bad. Remember, this is assessment that leads to evaluation and all of this has to do with, did we achieve what we were setting out to do and how do we get better? And if things just don't work out exactly the way you hoped or maybe the students didn't learn as much as you had, anticipated or learned things that were not part of the goals of the project, but other things, well, you report that anyway. Um, I've suggested that you introduce your results in digestible bites. By that, I mean <clears throat> perhaps short reports uh, within the, the larger uh, research or uh, assessment project. Uh, one of the things I would recommend is that you do suggest um, an action plan in terms of how the program will get better. If, rather than waiting for people who read the report and come up with suggestions for you, at least start the conversation in terms of how things are gonna be improved. And make the report interesting through the use of graphics, tables, and so on. Um, I've tried to make the slides for this uh, presentation interesting. Uh, and for me, what was the most interesting is that I used um, AI to, uh, to come up with the slides. The uh, PowerPoint um, uh, program 
uh, just asked me, do you want to make your slides more interesting? And I clicked on it. And sure enough, everyone came up with graphics and all kinds of interesting things. I have no talent uh, as a designer uh, or as someone who can can use the uh, the uh, graphics at hand. But by hitting that button, good things happened. And so I've tried to uh, try to do, do that is just simply an example of what you can come up with. Uh, and in my case, having no talent in the area. How about the next slide, please? A couple things that I don't want you to forget. Be sure that if you have an interest institutional policy or protocol about uh, how uh, human subjects and participants in research projects or assessment projects are to be treated, that you follow them, that you follow them to the T. Uh, protocols have been developed, especially uh, at the institutions that I'm the most familiar with, the ones where I've worked, uh, in terms of how we need to make sure that we achieve what's called an informed consent, uh, which means that the people who participate understand um, what the nature of the of the research project is that they're doing so uh, voluntarily and that they can opt out anytime they want. And of course, as I mentioned before, you report the results regardless of what you find. Uh, this helps transparency. Uh, this helps make, uh, make the point that your organization is one that's very interested in getting better uh, and that uh, you uh, certainly appreciate the observations and uh, uh, questions uh, related, by, by, uh, related from the uh, larger audience. And my last slide, please. I've listed a few references here that I think might be useful uh, for you to take um, a further look at. I would like to point out especially the second last uh, uh, the second last citation here, the Journal of Student Affairs in Africa, uh, that Dr. Schreiber uh, has been a, a key player in from its uh, beginning. Uh, the other uh, the other uh, uh, citations I think are useful, but I'd recommend that you read every issue of the journal as it comes out. I still get uh, copies of it uh, electronically, and I look it over every time I received I received the next uh, uh, the next edition of it. Uh, I think I've used up my time, and so I thank you for your attention, and certainly we'll look forward to comments from uh, the. Uh, other members of our of our group this uh, uh, this uh, uh, afternoon, and also your questions later on. Thank you very much for inviting me to share a few thoughts, ideas, and musings about my topic today. Thank you very much, Professor Shu. This has certainly <clears throat> been a very informative uh, presentation. So thank you very much for that. We're going to move over now to, um, or rather move on to the respondents. And our first respondent is uh, Professor Vasu Reddy. So, Professor Reddy, I'm handing over to you for your response on the keynote address. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, colleague. You'll be able to hear me clearly, right? Yes, we can hear you. Are you? Oh, great. Thank you. Sometimes one doesn't know if you're speaking to yourself. Firstly, let me say thank you for the invitation. Uh, to respond uh, to uh, to Prof Shu, and of course, thank you, Prof Shu, for the wonderful talk, the address, and of course, the insights. And of course, I must acknowledge also uh, your contribution significantly uh, to the, the the domain of student engagement. It's it's really a, a wonderful body of work. I cannot claim to have read all of that, but I've done some prep. Uh, uh, for, for this meeting, but of course, it's a pleasure to listen to you. Uh, I'm also aware that the, the domain of student engagement is not just simply praxis, it's a knowledge field. And that's critical in so far as what you've highlighted in your presentation. And, and very often we have found, um, and I'm not making this to be a sweeping claim, often our institutions of higher education misrecognize or sometimes erase that knowledge domain from our work. And I think it's very, very important what you, what you bring to our attention. I also want to say thank you also for highlighting critical conceptual issues. And of course, some real, 
tangible and meaningful practical in, uh, engagements or rather interventions. And, and I think that's quite, quite important in terms of looking at the nexus between praxis and research and, and how your ideas have been formulated. And pretty much, as you'd indicated at the start of the presentation, the purpose around an evidence-based approach to measure effectiveness of student affairs programs, including experiences and, of course, services. Secondly, um, the importance of high-impact practices, and you've uh, provided a wonderful catalogue of excellent interventions and examples, such as the first-year seminar, capstone courses, uh, you know, COIL programs, really fantastic initiatives. But also, thank you for reminding us of our own remit at the University of the Free State, particularly the DSA, in terms of enhancing student success, well-being, student development, and of course, meaningfully to improve student experience. And all of these issues are in many, many ways critically intertwined. As we've learned also from the critical literature, and especially through your body of work, the day-to-day -day demands of the profession may force choices that require a practitioner to leave scholarship to a faculty. But you remind us, I think, very, very importantly in your presentation, it is an important narrative, why it is important to counter that limitation. And this, in this way, your talk is timely as it is relevant, as it shows why a scholar-practitioner alignment with a strong research thrust is a magical relationship that enriches our interventions. And of course, what you have said elegantly aligns very well with our own vision, mission, and purpose of the University of the Free State, which you have highlighted an abbreviation in so far as our mission statement is concerned about being research-led, student-centered, regionally engaged, globally competitive, uh, well, to produce globally competitive graduates and knowledge. And of course, all of this, as good universities should, should be underpinned by important values of excellence, innovation and impact, accountability, a word you've used, care. And I think that is also very, very critical to your, to, 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 to your response. Uh, social justice for us and, of course, sustainability. Of course, all of these issues in a changing university environment, we know as South African universities, more often than not, have come out of very divided histories where principles of equality, diversity and inclusion, of course, and research integrity are absolutely critical. But let me just turn a little briefly to the metatextual level of your address. And, and I think that's quite important. And again, it underscores uh, the importance and in many ways the pivotal role that student affairs practitioner scholarship plays in our institution. Of course, uh, having done some reading preparation for this, for, for this response, it's quite evident there's a rich body of knowledge that has, that has emerged and, and, and evolving. And we've also heard that the people who conduct most of the published research in higher education and student affairs are not often the same people as those who practice in the larger domain of the profession. We've also learned that little is known regarding how much student affairs professionals engage research in their work or how to help them do so. And I think this colloquium and, of course, the colleagues that I work with are really showing us how relevant, how critical this is. And of course, in your work, we've learned also about important barriers to student affairs practitioners. I won't go into that. But I think a big issue that is so central is, is that practitioner scholarship is often not expected in some ways of practitioners, nor valued, and I can say that, by our institutions. And maybe that's not the case in the United States, but perhaps that is an observation I make here. And that's why this colloquium is of significant uh, importance and relevance. And perhaps more importantly, student success, student well-being, student experience, student development, in many ways, I think this is a narrative, is not simply the responsibility or a matter of teaching and learning and purely research alone. It's the people at that practitioner level, the professionals on a daily basis, who are critical in the broader ecology of an institution. Uh, many who are with us today, who are joining online, who, who are utterly dedicated to supporting students in achieving academic 
goals, their academic goals, their aspirations in so many different ways. But I really want to turn towards a conclusion as, as a response to your rich presentation. Of course, you said it's a wonderful tour, but you provided a beautiful snapshot with broad coverage of so many relevant issues. And I think the value and the effect of the scholarship work that you highlight for student affairs programs is critically important. What does it do? And I think that's what you share with us. It has the potential, critically, to transform higher education and improve student learning, including the lives, the quality of life of students in various ways, including also, and it has direct benefits for the institutions themselves. And, and I think that's, that's a critical point uh, that I also take through. Without overemphasizing, I think the issue you also highlight is the interrelationship between scholarly practice, scholarly outlets, and professional developments. And I think coming through in this presentation is, is really the, the critical focus of why scholarly practice is, has got to be intentional. In fact, you have said that in so many different ways. Uh, in your presentation, that it is informed by theory, it is data-driven, it is peer-reviewed, it is collaborative, and of course, a phrase or a word that I think is very popular with us as South Africans increasingly, it is open to epistemic diversity. In other words, it's not about foreclosing debate and discussion, but really opening up new ways of thinking with ideas and interventions. And so, student success, student well-being, student experience, student development, as I gather from your rich set of insights, is not to be treated frivolously. It's got to be treated with care, and these are serious matters. It demands our collective responsibility, and I think this is also important. This responsibility is contingent on accountability and ongoing improvements. And I think those are critical ideas I take, I take away with me. So Prof Shu, much more work, I think, as you've alluded, is necessary in so far as student engagement is concerned. There's much more to be done. And I want to thank you for generously sharing your ideas with us. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Val. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Reddy. Thank you for those insightful thoughts in your reflection on the keynote address. Without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Munita Dan Kutsia. I'm really honored to have been invited to respond to Professor Shu's address and to be part of the journey of student affairs at UFS, becoming more evidence based. I have had the privilege to learn from Professor Shu during the first Student Housing Training Institute hosted at Stellenbosch University in 2011 and since. Professor Shu has, as you heard, co-authored and authored pioneering books and articles about the role of assessment within higher education. Several of these books, I may proudly add, are in my office. A huge privilege, therefore, for me to be here today. As Professor Shu rightly pointed out, the vision of the University of the Free States, Vision 130, that was recently adopted, indicates that the UFS aspires to be a research-led, student-centered, and regionally engaged university. This has, of course, on many levels, implications for the functioning of student affairs within UFS. The four strategic pillars of student affairs, student success, well-being, development, and experience is something in which the role of assessment, evaluation, and research should be embedded. This has implications for the culture of student affairs. I believe that student affairs practitioners has got a lot to offer in terms of the assessment of student learning in the student experience, yet this potential is often overlooked and underutilized. A vital conversation within student affairs will be to really engage with all our practitioners and to achieve a collective understanding of what it is that student affairs would like to achieve. Within student affairs, we've got a variety of role players 
coming from a variety of disciplines. When we look at an academic faculty, all professionals have one discipline in common. This is not the case in student affairs. A collective understanding, therefore, of the role of research, assessment, and evaluation within student affairs at UFS should be established. Are we doing research? Are we evaluating? Are we assessing? And is this something that then applies to literally every individual within student affairs? Because as Prof. Shu rightly indicated, this implicates a shift in focus, a shift to research. Professor Shu also mentioned that assessment has got two purposes, accountability and improvement. Therefore, to identify what is going well and what perhaps not. The aim would then be to develop strategies to address these things that did not go so well the first time and to improve on what was done. However, this highlighted to me the importance of being intentional with your assessment and to allow it to run its course. Within student affairs, we unfortunately tend to, quite a big part of our time, be in reactive mode. We're not always able to manage our time as effectively as we would have wanted to. This keynote emphasizes for me the need for intentionality with regards to assessment and the importance of closing the process, ensuring feedback is plowed back into the cycle. The message I'm getting throughout the keynote address is that assessment should be as important as all the other fundamental activities within student affairs, like appointing staff, program development, and enhancing student learning. The Division of Student Affairs here at the University of the Free State is currently busy with a change management process, the aim being to move away from a rigid hierarchical structure towards a system of interconnected circles that will be agile and collaborative. These interconnected circles are formed by grouping similar functional areas together. And these four circles are our educators, our facilitators, our experts, and our analysts. They are categorized by their unique roles within the university. And these functional spheres then form crucial systems that operationalize support and collaboration between the similar functional areas. These functional circles will then form communities of practice within student affairs. And when we look at these communities of practice, specifically looking at our circle of analysts, that will be looking at research and innovation. This will be bringing a fundamental shift to student affairs at this university, especially with regards to research, innovation, sharing information, and assessment. This process is also leading to a space where people are not afraid to raise questions about how things are done in any area of the institution. Because at the end, their motive is to improve the student experience. This links to Professor Hsu's recommendation to add an assessment dimension into plans we have for new initiatives. This can be very possible in an agile and a collaborative environment. The three key elements mentioned by Professor Shu, assessment should be ongoing across the institution and promoting change in the desired direction. These provide the opportunity for us to collaborate with other stakeholders within the university, within South Africa, and globally. This provides us with opportunities to learn more about the student experience. Let's do something and start small. Thank you, Professor Shu, for a thought-provoking keynote address. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dan Kutsia. Much appreciated and uh, much food for thought. Um, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Birgit Schreiber for her response to the keynote address. Thank you, Dr. Schreiber. 
Thank you very much um, for inviting me as respondent. I'm very excited to see EC, electronically see Professor Shu. Um, quite in the beginning, before we started, um, I reminded him of how we visited Turkey with Professor Ludemann in 2012, it was, to start a student affairs association in Turkey. So um, there's been some exciting sort of travels in the past. Um, I just was reminded of. Thank you also to Dr. Veer Peval, Monita Dunn in the room here, lovely seeing you. And I'm sure there's some dear friends in the room and I'm also Professor Reddy, lovely to uh, see you online. You all commented, and Professor Shu, you as well, commented on the Free State's vision about student support and development. And amongst the institutions in South Africa, the Free State has always been very sincere and truly engaged and the Free State has always shown this, the University of the Free State has always shown this with deeds and actions that they take it very seriously. Um, and Professor Reddy and Dr. Dunn also recognized this. Many projects um, came out of the, Free State, uh, of the University of the Free State um, of national significance. Your VC, Professor Peterson and others um, have taken this very seriously. Prof Stratum does a lot of work, but also you, and um, VFP have done excellent work most recently with your report of national significance on creating an engaged higher education system. Um, many of us here in the room um, were part of your task team um, and you led that very powerfully, very, um, very importantly for the nation, for South Africa. So thank you Prof Shu for your paper, I mean, it was very stimulating and I wondered, or I, I did some thinking about um, the barriers and the challenges in assessments. Assessment, of course, is very, very important. And assessment is about evaluating ourselves, looking ourselves, self, looking at ourselves self-critically. It's very difficult to do this for a young discipline like student affairs in Africa, in South Africa. Our ability to critique ourselves and our work is very difficult. I'm not sure if we are sufficiently mature, sufficiently robust, sufficiently resilient to really withstand critique. So I'm just putting that out as a caveat to saying how hard it is to critique an immature or a young discipline. The scholarship, of course, the scholarship of critique is very, very important. And I want to, um, like Professor Reddy also did, move a little bit to the meta level and borrow from critical theory. Critical theory is any approach to humanities and the social sciences that focuses on society and culture um, in an attempt to reveal, critique, and challenge power structures. Critical theory is a school of thought that seeks to liberate people from all forms of oppression, I'm making a note, of forms of oppression and actively um, works to create a world in accordance with human needs, with capabilities aligned to the SDGs as a global social justice framework. So I want to borrow a little bit from feminism, critical race theory, post-structuralism, queer theory, post-colonialism, so the critical theory thinking. And I want to just point out five areas that perhaps I want to just keep in the back of our minds when we think about assessment. One of them is about goals. It is very difficult in our work often to be clear and explicit and objective about our goals. Often, Evidence is not there, data is not there, um, and a lot of people in the domain are guided by beliefs, by hoping to achieve something, and by lack of clarity around goals. Indeed, some of the goals are hard to operationalize because they're not immediate, they're not units of learning, they're often not instantly measurable, they're often not competencies that manifest in the very environment in which we are. So. And Professor Shu, you mentioned that as um, an indirect learning outcome. So often the goals are quite hard to define and then to measure as an outcome. The method of assessment is often quite limited. We can't measure often, we can't measure what our students then demonstrate perhaps elsewhere. So in other contexts, at home, or wherever they may want, or wherever they may demonstrate these competencies, we don't know that because a lot of what our students do is outside of the campus. Um, and so we, know, we can't be sure what has been internalized 
and what makes sense and what applies and what manifests outside of the context. Um, and so I just want to um, point to that. And Prof. Shu, you said, um, it's, um, you know, to get around that might be to use portfolios, to ask students what they've learned. A third area of, of caution or, or awareness I'd like to just call into our awareness is our own blind spots in doing assessments. It's the human condition. It's our intuitive, inherent blindness to ourselves. So we have blind spots that we don't see what we can't see, and we can't see what we don't see. And so um, diversity can protect us from that. If we have diverse teams, if we have students in our teams, if we have unlikely voices, uncomfortable voices amongst us, those are the kinds of voices that help us cover for our own blind spots, for which we can't help ourselves often, um, but those create barriers and inhibitors to good assessments. Assessment is also difficult without critiquing the very structures of our institutions. These are often invisible to us. We are entrapped by the cultures and institutional processes, by the institutional narratives and discourses, and institutional politics. These make us blind to many aspects of assessment of our students and our programs. Last area that I want to point out is the assessment um, the assessment systems that we sometimes borrow from. So we use terms and notions and systems from the global north. Dominant discourses that silence and blunt our own impulses, that blunt our own voices, internal voices. So we need to take good care to be locally attuned, to, be lo to hear locally lived realities. So the CAS standards are very useful, norms and standards from Botswana are very useful, but again, we need to develop our own framework, our own system of evaluation, which um, we need to do within our own local realities. Um, and while we can learn a lot from the Global North, those um, should only form guidelines um, and we shouldn't import those. Um, and Prof. Reddy, you mentioned that as an epistemic diversity, and that's quite true. We need to be aware of kind of what is what matters to us on the ground and be careful about the importing of knowledge systems from the Global North. So our assessment of student programming or student support um, is very important. And let's say we do evaluate a high impact practice, like for instance, putting students into study groups or into learning groups. And yes, that's very important, but we need to be careful to think about um, in what kind of context does this happen? What does it cost students to sit in groups? Who's got access to the group? Who can come to campus? Are they, do they have Wi-Fi access when they are in online groups and so forth? So there are a lot of contextual factors that make it difficult for students to be in groups, let's say, if that's a high impact practice. And um, those are the kinds of factors we need to take into consideration. Or well-being is another term that means so many different things in different environments. And while we define student well-being on campus in a particular kind of way, students go home to communities where well-being is defined quite differently. And so when we promote student well-being, what does it mean? What notions do we assume? Where are our blind spots? Um, and Prof. Shu, you mentioned that as a shortcoming. You recognize it as saying there are shortcomings in our assessments. Let's be explicit about those. So overall, um, um, for student development and support, I suppose I'm arguing for saying let's be critical of ourselves, as hard that might be. Let's hear uncomfortable voices, um, as uncomfortable as that, as that might be. Um, and yeah, I, I think that the, the one thought I just added right at the end is that I think one of the huge barriers to fair assessment uh, of our students is often us not recognizing the students, uh, the, the context within, our, within which our students live and learn. And, and we, we tend to at times minimize that context in the assessment of a program. And I just wanted to highlight that. Other than that, Prof. Um, Shu, thank you very much. And also Prof. Betty and uh, Dr. Dan Pizzia for your comments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Schreiber. Much appreciated on those insightful thoughts on the keynote address. Uh, Professor Shu, I'm going to hand back to you to give uh, your response to the input uh, provided by the respondents and also to make uh, some of your concluding remarks. Over to you, Professor Shu. Well, I very much appreciate uh, the responses from each of the individuals who were invited to become reactors. Uh, I'm uh, 
I'm just very, very pleased to get your, your feedback. I want to comment about just one element of each of the responses, uh, which I thought were rich, uh, insightful. And I've often thought one of the hardest jobs in any kind of uh, uh, professional conference circumstances to, is to try to respond to um, a, a presentation literally on the fly. I mean, you've had no chance to really process this or think about it. And uh, I thought everyone uh, did just a splendid job and I very much appreciate your insights. From Professor Reddy, you talked about the Student Success Project. Uh, I, and I, I wanna emphasize that the high impact practices which you referenced uh, come out of a research project. These are not practices that a group of people just sat in a room and dreamed up. Uh, George Koo has been a friend and colleague of mine for 45 years. Uh, we began working together in 1978 at Indiana University. And interestingly enough, George was on the search committee that ultimately hired, uh, hired me as the director of residence life. Um, the project that um, uh, led to these high impact practices, uh, again, about which George has, has written eloquently, was the student success in uh, college project that's uh, part of the reference list. Um, I was part of the team uh, that uh, uh, conducted the project. And uh, just so that people have a little bit of information about where did these come from, they came from a study of 20 institutions across the US, large and small, well-known and not, um, all of which had uh, higher than predicted retention rates from the first to second year and higher than predicted uh, gradu graduation rates. So these were institutions that were doing well. A group of 25 of us uh, formed uh, the research team and in groups of three or four, we visited every one of these institutions for a period of two to four days, um, interviewing people, attending events and so on, um, producing reports, asking the uh, people at the institutions to respond to the reports, and then going back a second time to talk further and interview more people. Altogether, we interviewed approximately 2,700 students, faculty, and others associated with these institutions. And by using a process of both uh, within institution and across institution analysis, uh, we developed uh, of the high impact practices, which are highlighted in the book. Uh, so I just, I just wanted people to know that um, <clears throat> because it's, again, it's not something that just a group of us got together and came up with some programs that we thought would work. In fact, these are ones that had been uh, very carefully uh, developed by each of these institutions that we visited. Uh, Dr. Don Katsie, who has been a colleague of mine for more than, uh, more than 10 years, going back to the first Akuho I visit, talked about starting small. Um, I cannot overemphasize uh, the idea of when you begin assessment projects to think small and not worry about massive global uh, projects that you might undertake, but rather start small. And again, maybe it's as simple as when a, when a program is over, asking students individually or in groups what they think they learned from participating and asking how they might demonstrate uh, the learning outcomes. The, the, the reference that I made to Carl Weick's work in terms of small wins can't be overemphasized here um, for all kinds of reasons. And if I had more time, I could even give you examples in my own life in terms of how I started something small and then it became larger. But I think that's a very good marker in terms of thinking about uh, beginning assessment projects. Uh, and the last comment I want to make, because we're running a little short on time, is Dr. Schreiber's, uh, I think, very pithy observation about context. Context means every meaning universities, colleges, and so on. And even within institutions, 
No two departments are the same. No two residence halls are the same. And so paying attention to the context within which the student experience uh, is planned and, and uh, delivered, I think is absolutely crucial. Um, and also the, the comment that uh, was made related to um, factors related to conditions that uh, may or may not make certain things possible. And there was discussion about uh, Wi-Fi access and so on. Um, I'm gonna tell you a, just a very quick story. So we're going to electronic access uh, to various events in the US. You can't get in without uh, having a personal device and having your tickets on the phone and so on. And so I was trying to get into a, an event a while ago and I had my ticket on the phone and the person said, well, this will work a lot better if you put it in your Google wallet. And my question was, as a 76 year old person, what's a Google wallet? I'm used to paper tickets. Um, and so the person explained it to me, I'm still trying to figure out how to, how to use a Google wallet. Uh, but there are assumptions that we make about the access that students and others have to various resources, such as Wi-Fi, such as having a personal device, such as having a personal computer, such as having access to other kinds of support. And I think it's really crucial to understand that in some contexts, not everybody has all these resources. Maybe the context doesn't emphasize this. And so uh, I think it's really crucial when we get into the whole matter of assessing and evaluating our programs and so on to be sure to understand uh, the context within which uh, the program uh, exists. I'll stop talking right there because I know we're a little over time. There you go. All right, so thank you very much, uh, Professor Shu, for your uh, response to the input from the uh, three respondents. Um, we've got a little bit less than 10 minutes for some questions and answers. Unfortunately, this option will only be available to those attending physically uh, in the audience, not to the online attendees. But I certainly would like to give the opportunity to those in the venue to ask questions. So if you ask your question, just please indicate to whom are you asking the question and then state your question and then we will give um, that uh, particular individual opportunity to respond. Okay, so any questions from the audience? We've got a mic. Um, Okay, so Gerben just indicated that on YouTube, you're also welcome to post a question. Gerben will check the YouTube platform um, and then uh, relate it to us. So, um, okay. Uh, thank you, thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Dr. Val. I am not sure who to whom uh, <laughs> to address the, what, the point I'm going to, to, to raise, but it's related to the question I asked Dr. Monita Dan could see um, earlier today about the gap between basic and higher education. The question now relates um, specifically to, you know, we, we, we prepare for our students and then once we introduce them to our programs, we often uh, uh, um, survey to, to understand their experiences so that we can improve our interventions. But um, I've been thinking, wouldn't it perhaps be even more helpful if um, as soon as we know who our students are going to be uh, uh, towards the end of the year, uh, for, for the following academic year, that we start engaging them uh, uh, already in order to measure, say for instance, their expectations, maybe their current situations before coming to university, uh, their greatest fears, what do they look forward to the most, so that uh, uh, when they are here, it's a continuation when we do these surveys to understand their experience of our welcoming programs, for example, we understand the transition, 
the transitional process from when their understanding of university was not influenced by anything that they experienced in the, in the, in the beginning of the year when we welcome them, but their expectations so that uh, we can, you know, uh, enrich our preparedness for, for, for them. So I think it will also be a very nice beginning spot to create and close, I mean, to create, you know, the, the conditions to eat away at that gap or to plug that gap, uh, even in other aspects of, uh, I don't know if I make sense. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Professor Shu, would you be willing to respond to that question? I, I think uh, what the uh, uh, questioner has pointed out is exactly on point in the sense that the transition to university uh, is something that can begin before the student enrolls. Uh, I do know that um, in some institutions in the US, uh, some reading material is provided for students before they enroll. And the reading material then forms the basis for the first year seminar. Um, I think the, the biggest issue would be to try to understand um, what the needs are of a student, of the students, before they enroll. So that suggests something pretty systematic in terms of sorting out what do they need, uh, and that can be uh, accomplished by asking them. I mean, it's, it could be that simple, uh, and also that complicated, or it can be asking students after they've completed a semester to, to think back before they enroll, uh, what did they need in the way of information or other resources that uh, uh, simply took a while for them to develop. So I, I mean, I, I think this is an excellent, an excellent point in terms of easing the transition uh, from before attending the university to actually being enrolled. Thank you very much. Uh, I, think, I think we've got time for one more question. Let me just check. Gerben, is there anything that came from the YouTube channel? Nothing at this moment. Anyone else? Vipi, in the can, Vipi can I reply to the, that question as well? Just a quick Ye comment. Yes, please. Please go ahead. But Thank the you. Value, the value of us asking which kinds of students, which type is arriving in our institution is one good way of going about it. But what we can always be busy with is examining our institutions of how student-centered they are. That is always a question that should be in the back of our minds. In a sense, almost regardless of who's arriving, we need to constantly interrogate our processes. How student-centered are they? Do they address, are they, anyway, yeah, to be student-centered. So interrogating our own institutions is something we can do all the time. Excellent, thank you so much, Dr. Schreiber. I'm scanning the audience to see if there's uh, one more question, a last question. Thank you, Tobias. Please proceed. Yes, uh, thank you to the panel for some, um, for your insights and stimulating further thought. I think I'll make my question brief, uh, considering the time of the day. And it, uh, it was very much stimulated by uh, Dr. Birgit's, uh, you know, ideas on the construction of knowledge and ep epistemology and how we would do well to critique the knowledge systems that we use to in inform what we do and how we do it. So in practical terms, how, how could we as, as Southern African practitioners um, Africanize uh, you know, the, the use of assessment and research methods um, you know, to be more reflective of our contexts? Thank you very much. Uh, Birgit, would you be willing to respond to that? Tobias, I'm, I'm getting very worried about how much time you think we have. Um, that is impossible for me to answer in the two minutes that are left. But I hear what you're saying around how do we make it locally relevant. Um, I, I don't think I can do justice and, and, and do an answer here other than to involve local voices. That means students, that means student leadership, that means your own staff. Um, that is where I would start. But, but yeah, I, I don't think I can do justice to this in two minutes. Thank you so much. Um, 
there was one question on YouTube, and I'm just going to read that. Um, you mentioned the hurdle of lecturers integrating ongoing research into their teaching expertise while ensuring that they get funding. What makes it a challenge for lecturers to be uh, ongoing researchers? So um, I guess the question uh, revolves around um, the, the intersect between lecturing and doing research and um, the impact that has on, um, on resources, including time, I, I suppose, but also uh, financial resources. Um, uh, Professor Reddy, um, would, would you perhaps be in a position to respond to that question that we received online? Uh, the question around the intersect be between teaching and learning and, and research and how that the, Im the implications uh, in relation to resources available to um, academic staff. I, I must uh, say thank you for that. Uh, like my colleague, Birgit, that, that, that is actually requires, uh, uh, you know, a much larger response. And I, I don't think full justice uh, achieved, you know, in terms of a, a, a convincing or answer at this stage. I think the ongoing challenge is that we, we must recognize the deep interconnections between teaching and learning and certainly research. And I think the colleagues on the platform have highlighted that, uh, particularly in terms of, you know, uh, how those relationships feed into each other uh, and, and what can be inflected where uh, and how. But the bigger question is around resources. And of course, we always tend to think that resources are usually financial. Uh, the question is, you know, we deal fundamentally with human resources uh, and how that is to be engaged. The ongoing project of learning is, I think, central to the meaning of a university. Uh, the challenge around resourcing in terms of financing and sustainability is equally, increasingly, as we see, not just simply in the global context, certainly at the local context, uh, the competing interests, competing demands for resources at a variety of levels and, and, and how we find ways to, to balance that in terms of the needs and, of course, to look at other ways of thinking creatively in order to, um, to, to provide such resources. So uh, perhaps you might say it's a mischievous response to Dr. Val, but again, I think this is a subject of deep conversation uh, and again, I think the point made about context is so relevant here uh, to the highly differentiated nature of, of our institutions, the South African institutions of higher learning, certainly when compared to the global context, um, the, the, the various challenges we each have in, in unique ways. And so it's an ongoing project. Uh, certainly uh, no definitive answers or solutions can be provided at this stage. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Reddy. Um, I'm concluding by uh, thanking each participant. I want to thank uh, each one of the respondents, uh, Professor Vasu Reddy, uh, Dr. Birgit Schreiber, Dr. Munita Dankutsia. Uh, thank you so very much for, uh, for being available, availing yourself to, um, to respond. Thank you for your insightful in input that you gave to the keynote address. It's much appreciated. Um, I have to mention that Dr. Sibusiso Chalufu also sent a, a small video recording um, uh, earlier this afternoon, which we will definitely also share on our social media platforms, a response to, um, um, to his um, um, input on the keynote address. We will share that on social media. So also a word of thanks to uh, Dr. Sibusiso Chalufu. And then to our keynote speaker, Professor John Shu. thank you so very much. It has been an absolute privilege having you on the platform, uh, very enriching, and uh, my hope is, as I have shared with you in our um, engagements uh, in preparation for this keynote address and the colloquium, that what you have shared will really impact everybody that's um, in this uh, venue, but also online. We have recorded it. We will continue to share it uh, in South Africa. And we, we really appreciate your input, and we trust that he will, it will have a lasting impact on the area of student affairs and higher education in South Africa. So thank you very much uh, from myself and the University of the Free State uh, to each and everyone for your valuable contribution. Thank you very much. Thanks for your kind words.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As the people are uh, disconnecting from the electronic platform, um, I'm going to hand back to the program director. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, VP just wants me to come up and here. All right. Uh, so that's all for our closing remarks. I'm going to ask Kamakhele Tebe to come just say a couple of words, and then we're going to talk about what is going to happen tonight. Kalakim 2023, please welcome Kamakhele. Can I have a seat? Oh, please do. <laughs> I think this is the graveyard shift, I guess. Um, okay, the light is a bit of an issue. Um, good afternoon, colleagues. For those who don't know me, my name is Gamachelo Ditebe. I am a faculty coordinator in the Student Governance Office.